Bombshell Brunches, where your hosts Raquel Rudenberg and Christina Lau sip and spill with badass babes every Tuesday morning. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. It is Tuesday. <laughs> I love our Tuesday ch- evolving jingles. Uh, let's uh, let's welcome everybody back. Welcome back. Welcome. <laughs> um oh we've had such a great uh such a great day uh we have been speaking to jessica morehouse from the mo money podcast and let's launch straight into our our l3s our la la la's uh our learning loathing learning loving we can't get these these words right. We keep stumbling on them. But it's been I'm, a long day. I think we've I'm just going talked to... a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Learning, loving, learning, loving, loathing. Um, uh, so you go first, Raquel. Um, okay. Learning, loving, loathing. I, I just want to say like as a takeaway from, from this podcast episode, um, I really liked the idea of kind of being kind to to yourself and in the podcast Mm. episode we really talk about it in terms of money and um being kind with yourself if you make mistakes and money is earnable and you know it's fine and it's okay to not know everything about it um and kind of facing your fears on learning more about it and i just i that really sank in with me so That's that's my takeaway on learning because I'm not always the kindest to myself. Um, <laughs> and loving, I'm loving meeting so many people outside my wheelhouse. We we're getting a lot more, um, just different different people on the podcast, and to me that's really exciting. I love meeting people who have different brains than me, people who function differently and have different values and different knowledge bases, and that that's just very very exciting to me. Um, I am loathing the stress that is coming with leaving so soon, and this is probably such a reoccurring theme on all of my intros lately, but, uh, it's like a couple weeks away, so it's, it's soon, and there's a lot of stuff to do, and I also have my move the exact same week, like literally days before my exam, and within the same week that my boyfriend is leaving to South Africa, which is a different country than I'm going to. So it's a lot. I'm feeling it. (laughs) I, yeah, I don't, I don't know how you're, how you're doing with all of that, but you seem to be so composed. (laughs) The fire rage is inside. It's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So my three, not dissimilar really. Uh, Jessica had this wonderful way of simplifying a lot of these concepts. Mm -hmm. And I've been learning actually the last few weeks about how to engage with different apps and tools to be able to monitor my spending. And uh, I'm using, I bank with TD at the moment. So I've got this TD spending app that I've allowed push notifications. So I'm learning how to kind of how to how to use them and repurpose my ki- mindset to be more like you said as well forgiving about where i'm at financially uh i am loathing the state of the economy and where we're going and mm. i think that's what that's what kind of brought that on that that kind of reality that hit home for me as we move into a, a second wave of mm-hmm. this pandemic where you know, it's a bit of a free for all. So I'm loathing that there's so much uncertainty, but I'm really loving the opportunity to shift my mindset accordingly. And I think that, you know, I'm really grateful for this community and these people that we've, we've brought in. And I mean, you found uh, Jessica from Mo Money and I listened to one of her podcast episodes and I can't wait to listen to more because, you know, these knowledge is power. And I think that I'm really loving that we've carved ourselves out a little opportunity to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And she just says it in such a fantastic way. And she's so, she spins it. So money doesn't become a negative thing. So many people hate money and yeah. she really spins it. So it becomes a little bit more exciting and yeah, it's good. It's not in a money. It's yeah. not our, it's not our enemy, our man enemy anymore. <laughs> man enemy. Oh, I like that. No, I like uh, that too. Well, without further ado then, Let's introduce 
Jessica Morehouse from the Mo Money Podcast. All right. I would like to welcome Jessica Morehouse, to, who is the go-to millennial money expert in Canada and the hostess of the Mo Money podcast. Jessica is a wealth of knowledge, <laughs> and some of you may already recognize her from media outlets such as CTV News, BNN Bloomberg, Breakfast TV, Vice, Money Sense, and so, so, so much more. We are incredibly thankful to have her here today and all to ourselves so we can ask her our deepest, darkest money questions. <laughs> Welcome to Bombshell Brunches, Jessica. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, we're so excited that you're here. Yeah, we do. <laughs> and we have so much to ask. I have so much to ask. I don't even know if I want to get to my darkest questions. <laughs> Let's um, work up to that, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> We just met. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to start with a safe one. Uh, mm. Because you're a film school student. You went to yeah. film school. I did. And I want to know about that because uh, being an actor, a working mm. actor as well, uh, I want to know how a film school student lands in the world of finance. And I know that you do have a podcast episode on this, but mm. just, a, just a quickie so we can, we can ca catch our audience up. Yeah. Oh gosh, that podcast episode is probably like five years old now. So I don't even want to think of what I shared. I was <laughs> such a newbie when it came to podcasting. So um, basically what's funny is how, how does like a film student end up working uh, as a personal finance expert? Um, it has everything to do with the financial crisis, actually. Um, I never really thought about money going to school, you know, in high school. I'm like, what do I want to be when I grow up? And I had these really big aspirations of, you know, winning an Oscar and being one of the few female film directors and all of this uh, kind of stuff. And then I uh, went to Simon Fraser University um, and, uh, you know, studied in their film program. It was such a great experience. I absolutely loved every moment of it. And then in my last year, when we were all focusing on um, doing our, our final projects, which was a short film that we would eventually send to a bunch of film festivals, and it would be kind of the start of our careers, I started asking my professors, wait, so how after this, what do we do after this? Like, how do we get jobs though? And no one had an answer, which really scared me. And they're like, well, have you thought about doing a master's? I'm like, that's just more school though. How do I make money after this? And I think what really freaked me out too is after we all graduated, about a month after, actually our professors um, organized this kind of seminar with a bunch of uh, older graduate, and these people were working in the industry, and they were maybe at the time 30s, 40s, 50s, um, working on reality shows, or, or they were independent filmmakers, people that we looked up to, we knew their names, and we're like, oh, I aspire to be, and it was the scariest seminar ever. These people, and again, this was 2009, um, when things were not so great, and they basically the whole time scared us, you know, uh, basically saying it's really hard out there. Um, you know, I thought I was going to be this uh, really big, you know, popular cinematographer and here I am doing the Bachelorette Canada. So you're just like, okay, this is not what we kind of signed up for. We, we did four years of school where it was all about being an artist and being true to your, your passion and your craft. And then hearing from these you know, graduates that were saying, yeah, if I were you, I'd look at something else. And I remember specifically, this one guy in my class, God bless him, he wanted to be a film editor. And I remember just like the desperation of him being like, what, can you f help me find a job? Like, how am I supposed to get in the door? How do I, you know, start my journey of becoming an editor? And the guy's just like, yeah, you got to know people. And yeah, I just oh. can't really help you. It was just terrifying. And oh. so that was me entering kind of the real world and I'm like well this isn't this isn't what I thought it would be and so like a scaredy cat I just immediately kind of pivoted I, I was lucky in that I got a job through my professor um, after I graduated with the the Vancouver Film Festival which was so great but it was a four-month contract it ended and then I was unemployed for eight months and I was applying for any job under the sun that I was remotely qualified for um, and eventually got a job in sales and marketing at the Georgia Strait, um, worked there for three and a half or yeah, three and a half years. And 
basically during that time, I needed to kind of figure out what, okay, what, what are we doing here? What's our career look like? We're not going to be working in the film industry. It doesn't look so good for, for us. And that's actually when I, I started, you know, reading personal finance blogs, reading books, because I was mainly just trying to figure out how do I stretch my very, very tiny salary and living in Vancouver with roommates. Mm. Like I was broke. How do I live my life? And I kind of found my, I, I guess I kind of stumbled uh, into what I now find is like my kind of purpose in life is to now help other people feel good about money and, and manage their money in a friendly, relatable way. And I love that because it's unfortunate that that is the recurring theme of so many people who go into theater school. I trained in theater school. Mm. Um, and so many people I know who I also worked in a recording school mm -hmm. um, where a lot of people just say, their answer to what to do when you're in the industry or like what to how mm -hmm. to get into the industry and how to make money at the end is so is so negative mm -hmm. uh, and the reality is it always comes up at the end of the studies yeah which is you know of course makes sense when you're an institution that wants to <laughs> you know profit on people's dreams mm -hmm. but it, i don't believe that that has to always be the way i think that expectations management is a really mm -hmm. huge part of working in creative industries specifically in media and entertainment um but I think that it needs to be integrated into the educational process. Uh, and I, the question I have for you really is, was there a part of you when you graduated uh, and after you, and while you were at the Georgia Strait mm -hmm. that wanted to stretch that little money that you were making to continue to make films or to continue to yeah. do things? Or did you just pivot entirely? Yeah, actually, yeah, I, I hadn't given up on my dream because also, you know, I'm still close with all my classmates and, you know, so many of us were still trying, we didn't want to let go of that dream again, we spent so much right. time together uh, working on our, you know, films and we're like, what, you know, we can't just give that up. And so actually my, I think it was in 2010, so I got my job at the Georgia Strait, finally moved out on my own. And there's a thing, I don't know if it exists anymore in Vancouver, but it's called Crazy Eights. Is that still yeah, thing? it's still yeah, here. Crazy? Just yeah. did its 30th year last year. Yeah. I, I was the music sponsor for a couple of years. Oh my gosh. So yeah. So I remember, and you know, I'm, I must've been 24 or something like that. I applied. I was actually in the final or not the final round, but just about to be, uh, I was like the second round. So I wasn't was picked. Yeah. Was it the yeah. 16 or top 20? Yeah, I was in like whatever the top. So I was almost yeah. picked. Oh. Um, they liked my idea, and it was a great. I still think it's a great idea for sure. Oh. Um, <laughs> but it. I was. I know. Yeah, ten years later, do it. <laughs> I, I feel like I've lost all. I don't think I remember how to make a movie anymore. It's been that long. But it, that was my kind of, I think, last kind of ditch attempt to to let's try this out. It didn't work out. And for me, I took that as a sign, maybe we need to do something else. Because even if I did get into Crazy Eights, the actual idea, I actually was kind of relieved I didn't get picked because it kind of scared me, like figure out how do I finance this? How do I get a crew? How do I, it just, for me, I think if you're really passionate about something that excites you and you're like, let's do it, let's figure it out. For me, it terrified me. And that kind of made me take a minute, be like, maybe you are really passionate about film, but maybe it's not meant to be your career. So for me, that was my kind of last ditch attempt. And then I kind of put that to bed. And I just, you know, I, I read blogs, I started my own personal finance blog. And that was just for fun. Honestly, I just wanted the creative outlet because I was used to writing all the time from being in film school. And then I just kind of worked for a few years. And then eventually being there for three and a half years, I got really kind of like, I need, you know, I need something exciting. I, you know, I just felt stuck. And that's what kind of inspired me and my husband to uh, leave Vancouver, sell all of our stuff and move to Toronto and, and see what, what would happen. And we've been here for se seven and a half years now. Wow. Mm -hmm. I want, I want to ask, so sorry, <laughs> sorry, Raquel. No, that's okay. You guys have done so much with it. Like to me, that's just so interesting because, um, I still see the, the thread of creativity. Mm -hmm. You still aren't necessarily working in nine to five. Like you've created mm -hmm. this business on your own. So you're very entrepreneurial still. So, mm -hmm. um, you've got your YouTube channel, you've got the podcast. Mm -hmm. It's still very audio visual. So it's pretty mm -hmm. cool. You actually found something that you were really good at. And then we're able to weave those together anyways. Yeah. I didn't let that degree go to waste, I guess. No, you <laughs> so that. honestly, when I do the YouTube, I feel like I'm such a like beginner YouTuber because I was one of those kind of like purists when it came to film. Like when I was in film school, I remember going back to my high school and doing a little mentorship, like a little presentation with all the students and being like, oh, you know, I'm in film school. You can, you know do my path. Oh my gosh. I hope no one actually did that. <laughs> you know, they would have been in the same situation as me, but I remember they were talking about, and this again, was in like 
2008 or something like, oh, YouTube, I think it's going to be the next big thing. I'm like, nah, it's just a trend. I wouldn't waste my time. If I just listened to that, you know, 16 year old who told me YouTube was going to be the next thing, probably could be a millionaire by now. But uh, now I waited like 10 years or whatever to actually get started on YouTube. <laughs> Well, we waited a lifetime. We're, we're yeah. barely on it now. <laughs> Let alone like TikTok and all these other ones. Just you know like, what? Don't oh, even bother. Oh. For me, I can't. I tried TikTok right. in the summer. I much. think it was too much. Like it too literally much. caused me anxiety to the point where I couldn't sleep. I was dreaming about these things. I'm like, this is too much for me. I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you. I feel you. Um, okay, so I mean, that's great. I love that background. I mean, we could go into mm -hmm. the, the kind of background for, <laughs> for hours. Um, I do want to ask, how has Toronto been better for you? It, it really has now looking back to where we are now. Uh, that first year though, I will say, which was, um, we moved here in 2013, wait, yeah, 2013, I think. I'm like, when did, what year did we get married? 2013, I think. We got, because how it happened was uh, we we went to Thailand for a month backpacking. We, it was our kind of dream trip. I took a, you know, good chunk of time off work. And that's when we actually decided to, to move because um, both of us were like, well, we've always lived in our hometown. So maybe we should do something kind of crazy. You have those kind of spiritual awakenings when you're traveling. And then we went back. And then a couple months later, we had our wedding. We got married. And then I gave notice at my work. And then we uh, yeah, packed up everything and left, which sounds insane. But, you know, when you're in your 20s, I think you have the energy and you the totally passion do. to do that. Now in my 30s, I'm like, there's no way I'd ever do that again. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, but the first year in Toronto was brutal. Like it was the worst year, very dark, um, which is crappy because like the first part of that year was so magnificent. We went to Thailand, we got married, we yeah. went to Disneyland, like it was magical. Second half of the year, dark, unemployment, uh, lived in a really tiny apartment, um, couldn't find work for a very long time. I worked a lot of weird, odd jobs until I eventually found some work, but then the work that I found that was like sort of a stable job was in the newspaper business, which I was trying to get away from. So I kind of felt like a failure. I'm like, I'm literally moved across the country to do the exact same job I left. This is not mm. the plan. My husband had a hard time finding work because he works in the music industry, actually. He's, oh. um, he is a freelancer. He has his own business as a uh, mixer. So he mixes okay. music. And uh, before he used to work at um, a big studio in Vancouver, actually. And so which this was one? the first time. The Warehouse. Oh, okay. Yeah. We know some similar people. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a small community in Canada. I feel like yeah, everyone kind of knows each other. So we can talk <laughs> after about that. It's kind of funny. Um, and so this is his first kind of uh, trial of, of, you know, finding his own clients from scratch. Like we really didn't know anybody in town. And so it was rough. I also went back to school. I did a certificate in digital uh, marketing management at U of T just because I, I thought maybe I'll work in marketing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was a rough year. I wanted to move back every single day. Um, but oh. I like, let's stick it out for a year and just give it time. And eventually found uh, another uh, job that was uh, in marketing. And I stayed there for almost three years. And and then on the side, I was always doing my blog. And then I eventually added a, a podcast and and just really kind of put myself, I think because I never really found that, I don't know, fulfillment in any of the jobs I ever had. I was, I was hoping so. And I never kind of turned out that way. I just kept on putting my, pushing myself to do more in the personal finance community. And then I realized, Hey, maybe this is what you should be doing for a living. Maybe try mm -hmm. that for a change. I love yeah. that you didn't give up. I love that you just kept looking. I think that's yeah. a really, that's a huge point for our listeners, right? Is, mm -hmm. you know, you go in and you, you, you move to, you take that big leap and it doesn't look like what you dreamed it would mm -hmm. and you keep looking. And I love that. Uh, so I want to launch straight into that, that mm -hmm. finance side, you know, um, because I am going to admit that I'm pretty terrible when it comes to finances <laughs> and I'm just starting to learn uh, about many, many things. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about some of the key terms because for me, a lot of the time when people think about finance, the intimidating thing is not knowing the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And then when you go and sit with a, 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 a money expert or a specialist, mm -hmm. it can be a little bit degrading for me mm -hmm. to, to hear these terms. So let's, let's just debunk that. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's FI? What's the FIRED movement? Oh gosh. You know, <laughs> 
<laughs> those, are, those are two things that I've just literally never heard of. Oh, goodness. Okay. Well, first I want to say that you, let's debunk the first thing. You're not bad at money. No one's bad at money, right? It just means you only have, you have some tools, maybe not all the tools. Um, one thing I learned as, you know, I eventually um, did this program to become an accredited financial counselor is um, instead of thinking that yeah, you're bad at money or it's your fault or, oh, I'm just not good at that. It's a natural thing that some people just pick up. It's not, that's not true. It really just has to do with your own financial literacy. And unfortunately, most of us didn't learn this in school or even in college or even in our twenties, unless you, mm. you know, really come across someone who does know this stuff, like a friend or a family member. That's how a lot of people kind of have that leg up on lots of people. Oh, my dad is good at that. Or my aunt is really good at that. Mm -hmm. um, or if you stumble upon like a blog or a podcast or some sort of content that kind of piques your interest. Um, but most people, they may never, you know, realize that, which is what they get older and then they're like, Oh, I'm in debt or I have the situation. What do I do? Um, but in terms of like the, the key terms, the one thing that I kind of want to debunk is that personal finance is complicated. That was the one thing that used to intimidate me. I was very intimidated by the world of finance. Um, and also because, I mean, it's changed a lot and it may not look like that, but I mean, like the, the center of this bubble, it's definitely changed in the past 10 years. But when I first started out trying to find books and blogs, just white men, just old white men and not relatable at all. I'm a woman, I'm a millennial. I want someone who has you know, a different voice who I can relate to. And luckily there are a lot more people, especially too, talking about diversity, a lot more people of color coming out with, we need those voices too. Mm -hmm. And so it's definitely improved, but um, I mean, it's still sometimes feel like it's an exclusive club, especially when it comes to investing. A lot of women especially feel excluded. We don't feel like we're part of the conversation because for so long it was just men part of that conversation. Yeah. So going back to the key terms, some really key terms I want to say is number one, um, we hear the term budget all day long and I feel like it's lost all meaning. No one knows what that actually means. A lot of people think it just means um, you're restricting yourself from spending. It's kind of a negative thing. Um, and I think part of that reason is because if you think of some of the really top money experts or authors out there that have been around for a while, they usually have, they have a certain tone that I think younger generation of money experts are trying to shift, which is they have this very negative tone. You're, you're spending too much. You're in debt. How dare you? You have to get out of debt. Um, you should be ashamed. Like there's a lot of shame and guilt. And I think they're using that. They've used that for a tactic that I guess was successful for a while to change people's spending habits, but it also makes people feel terrible about themselves and their money. And that actually can, you know, make people rebel and just not take that advice. Mm -hmm. Um, so instead of thinking things of, as a budget, because it kind of has that negative connotation, I like to use the term spending plan. A plan, who doesn't love a plan? Everyone likes a plan, planning a trip, you know, planning a wedding, planning whatever. Plans are kind of exciting because it means something good is going to happen at the end. So spending plan just means, okay, we, we all earn money, figure out how much and how do you plan to spend it? And by spending it, that could mean tucking it into a savings account, putting it into your investments for retirement, or spending it on you know your your necessities, or spending it on some of your um, your wants and desires. So spending plan much more accessible and fun. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about fire? <laughs> you want? I just want it's, to know what they mean. Yeah. I don't know what that. What FI right. means? FI, FI just means uh, financially independent. Uh, FIRE means financially independent and retire early or fine. Yeah, basically it just means uh, it's oh. this whole movement that's kind of come about. Um, and I don't know how long it's been around, but I feel like I only kind of found out about it four years ago. It's definitely, a, a, it didn't exist when I started blogging. Um, there was definitely people that talked about retiring early, but really when people talked about that, they meant like by forties or fifties. That's what um, I thought when I was listening. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's still a thing. I mean, I think it's great if you want to achieve retiring early by your fifties or, or what have you like freedom 55, that used to be, you know, kind of a, mm -hmm. a key term people would throw around fire is now this whole movement of instead of retiring early at 50, why not retire early at 30, hmm. a bit, a bit <laughs> more aggressive um, and more intense, but there is this whole movement of people working like crazy during their twenties or, or even early thirties. So they can retire, you know, quote unquote, mm -hmm. um, by their thirties or forties. So it's for me, it can be an exciting thing if you're trying to figure out what's that kind of thing that excites me to, to read more, to educate myself more about investing in personal finance. 
there's a lot of things I don't like about the whole movement, but that's kind of like any niche in the personal finance community. There's always going to be something that you just don't agree with. <laughs> yeah. I, I really like that because there's, I love that you've just kind of given people a whole bunch of different ways to go and get curious, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and for me, that, that feels great when you say, you know, as soon as you said, um, you know, spending plan versus a budget mm -hmm. and, you know, thinking of it from a generosity perspective as, instead of a scarcity mm -hmm. mentality, it just leaves me feeling a lot better. It might not work for everybody, but knowing that there's, here's the first step for me to take to mm -hmm. look for more things that make me feel good mm -hmm. about money, mm -hmm. that's really helpful in itself. Mm -hmm. And even like talking more about, you know, because a key thing that people want to know is like, how do I cut my spending or how, how do I save more of my money? I have a spending problem. That's, you know, a lot of people have a spending problem. Mm -hmm. And in the past, people would talk about, well, you just have to cut this and cut that and stop spending so much money, get on a budget. But again, is aggressive and kind of negative. Instead, again, there's more of a shift now. People are talking more. It's not so much that spending is bad or spending money on this or this is bad. It's more, let's be more intentional with where our money is going. Because, mm -hmm. you know, mindfulness is becoming really big in the personal finance sphere. And it really just means, okay, have a good idea of how much money is coming in and where do you actually want it to go? It doesn't matter like the whole, you know, we've all heard the latte factor and you're like, oh, don't buy your avocado toast or latte. That's what's, you know, making it so you can't afford a house, which is absolutely ridiculous. And you the numbers, like that's not why you can't afford a house. Um, it's more just like buy your latte, but it, also understand what your own personal limitations are. So definitely mm -hmm. figure out what your personal values are, make sure your dollars are going towards that, but also understand you can't have everything. So some things are going to have to go. So if you do have to cut things, cut things that don't bring value to your life, that don't actually help you reach some of your financial goals. Great. It kind of reminds me of, uh, of like diet culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? There's diet, so many links between fitness yeah. and finance. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that movement. It's almost like crowding out the bad spending. You can put it in, in <laughs> things that make you excited. That's what I thought mm -hmm. of when you were talking about um, your spending plan versus mm -hmm. your budget. It's more mm -hmm. about like, you know, getting excited and, and putting them in, in places that you're excited about rather than... Um, yeah, rather than kind of giving yourself that bad feeling afterwards if you mm -hmm. do buy yourself a latte. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, who cares? It's a latte. Enjoy your money. Because, mm -hmm. like, and that's part of, I think, my, you know, the thing that I kind of don't quite like about the FIRE movement is because it is about living an extreme lifestyle to achieve an extreme goal. Mm -hmm. And although lots of people have done that and seen success and that's great, I feel like a lot of people, regular folks that just work jobs, but want to have, you know, more security in their life, more stability, you know, it's not always um, attainable to live that kind of restrictive, um, aggressive um, kind of life. And so we need to find balance in that. And how do we do that? And it's by doing like little things like, okay, maybe just tweaking your, you know, spending plan a little bit more, having those really clear goals. And the one thing that I recommend to everybody, especially people, if they're like, I don't know if I'm even comfortable with the budget that scares me to death, what can I do? is at least start tracking your net worth, which is really, and mm. most people have no idea, like how much money do you have? How much debt do you have? How, like what is your personal net worth? And if you track that, you know, starting, you know, at the beginning of every month or at the end of every month, whatever you like, um, and do that consistently either every month or every quarter, or even just once a year, then you have that like hard data that you can see, am I making progress? Is my net worth growing? Which means your wealth is growing, which means you are making positive moves with your money. If you don't do that, you, like for me, I never tracked my spending or my net worth for years and years and years, even when I was blogging, I've only been doing it for the past four years, it's been the most empowering thing because I have the information, the truth mm -hmm. of the matter that yes, what I've been doing is working because I am, you know, have more assets and no debt compared to where I was four years ago. And I have the information, like, this isn't just like what I think is going on. This is what's actually going on. And I, oh, I want I to that. jump in so quickly. Sorry, just yeah, on, no, that, go. on that net worth. Can you, mm -hmm. how, how do I calculate that? Like I have a mortgage. How do I calculate what's 
an asset? What's a, like, what do I need to do? Oh yeah. Super easy. So it's really just like, you've got your assets and then you minus your liabilities, which is your debts. And then you get your net worth. So what are your assets? So that's cash you have investments. You have any kind of asset that you could sell potentially for cash. So that could be a home, could be a car, could be, you know, valuables that you're like, no, this is like a valuable painting I inherited that I can sell for a couple hundred dollars or something like that. Anything that can be converted eventually into cash. Um, and then your liabilities is what kind of debts do you have? So if you have a balance on your credit cards, if you have student loans, if you have your mortgage on there, um, yeah, so, so for the home, it's you, you an asset would be the value of the home. What could you sell that for today? And then the debt would be, what do you owe on that home still? So someone who owns a car could just easily look up what's the make mm-hmm. model year yeah. of my car and figure out, okay, this is how much black I, I have in that value. Absolutely. And then just making sure, because that's a depreciating asset, the longer mm-hmm. you hold on to that car, the less it's valued at updating that, uh, that number. And same with your home, as it increases in value, hopefully it'll keep increasing in value then you can update that number as well. Great. Love mm-hmm. it. But yeah, that's really all it is. It's very simple. It should take you, I mean, getting started, logging into all your accounts, maybe now 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing what to, knowing what to look at. And I, I was stumped a little bit on that mortgage side where it's like, mm-hmm. uh, is this a debt? Is this just a pure debt? But yeah, you just made that very clear. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to pass it to Raquel because I've been talking a lot. But Raquel's got <laughs> a few more questions for you. <laughs> I just get so excited. I'm like jumping in here and there. Um, so I'm going to jump around here a little bit, but everyone wants money, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, especially if you're living somewhere like Vancouver, Toronto, New York, Mm -hmm. San Francisco, there's like very expensive cities. Um, But no one really talks about money. So I had a couple questions surrounding that, how to talk to people about money, um, whether that's like friends and family, how open you Mm -hmm. should be, like, I I don't want to say should be Mm -hmm. for someone's personal comfort, but just what would, what would help us as a society? Um, Mm -hmm. What about sharing salaries? I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm always so curious about that one because it's so taboo, but um, yeah. And it's difficult because you also don't want to encroach on someone else's privacy. Not everyone's comfortable. Like I'm yeah. super comfortable, but even for the salary thing, the only ever time I was ever comfortable asking like my coworkers, how much do you make? Which is awkward when you work together. It was when I was on the way out when I'm like, yeah. I'm leaving here. So it doesn't actually matter. Tell me how much you make. And every time you realize I should have, I wish I knew this sooner. I wish I had this information sooner that's harder when you are still working with people. Cause most people are like, I don't want you to know because it could change the dynamic of your, your workplace. So it's yeah. almost sometimes easier asking people if you're trying to figure out, am I earning enough or, or could I be earning uh, more somewhere else? Look for similar people in your role at a similar company and you can maybe hit them up over LinkedIn or, or maybe there's a, a friend connection that can introduce you to kind of get that information. So you have a, a better insight. That's something that I really, really regret my 20s. I never negotiated any salary. I was always just like, yes, thank you so much for giving me a job. And then always, always regretted it when I was at that job being like, I, I'm not earning enough for what I'm doing every single time. Never learned my lessons until I became self-employed. Then I'm like, I'm all, I, now I have to negotiate every single amount of money that I earn for my business. So I'm definitely better at negotiating than I was. So that's definitely something that comes with experience and time, but it is something that I think especially women should be doing uh, a lot more. But in terms of like just talking about money with friends and family, I think the easiest way is for kind of those conversations to kind of happen naturally. So when you're out and you're out at dinner, it's like, who's paying? And that's a great way to kind of start that conversation of, or even before you order, it's like, how do we want to pay? Are we going to split this? Are we going to do our own thing? And you can kind of get a sense of maybe how people feel or react to those conversations. Sometimes also when you're like in a a close friendship with someone, it's easier to kind of have those conversations. For me, I've been lucky because I've had this uh, platform that talks about, I'm so open about money, even though I've never, like in the past with my blog, I was more open with my own personal finances, not so much anymore, but people know they can easily, like all my friends know they can come to me. If they want to talk about money, they know I'm a no judgment zone. I'll give them, you know, my time and and my thoughts, uh, no problem. So it is one of those things you have to kind of just kind of take time. Family, sometimes it's harder. Uh, Mm -hmm. But again, sometimes you have to kind of let those conversations happen naturally. Like one thing as we're entering the holidays is, and we're in this pandemic is like figuring out what are we doing for, you know, presents? Like, 
I can't afford yeah. some because maybe I lost my job or I, my hours were cut. Um, it's hard to kind of have those conversations, but what I want to remind people is, especially when it's a, a conversation, like I can't afford that. I can't go on this family trip or, or what have you. Everyone doesn't want you to go into debt um, because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they usually just don't know that you can't. And most people are so, um, you know, okay with having those conversations. If you're maybe the first one to bring it up. I think yeah, it's there's no easy point. way to like really get into it, right? It's it's, no. it's difficult. It's difficult for sure. And how about like people who have kids? Like, how do you talk to? How do you start that conversation? Because I just I know mm -hmm. for me, like, I was never raised talking about money. Mm -hmm. It was not talked about enough. Oh yeah, I think that's pretty common. Yeah, same with me. I mean. We only talked about money in the context of we can't afford this. Basically. Right. <laughs> right. So I knew that we, you know, we didn't have that much money growing up. And that was like, okay, but that was the extent. I never knew how much my parents made. They never told us. And even when I asked, they're like, no, we're not talking about that. It's not appropriate. I think things are getting a little bit easier, but uh, for me, that's why I think I was so attracted to the personal finance community online because people, even though they're kind of strangers, are very open about their numbers or you can talk mm -hmm. to them. They're like, yeah, I'm totally happy to share. So sometimes that's an easier place to start. And then you can slowly kind of integrate that into your own personal relationships. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess the, the really important one is if you're dating somebody and you're entering this relationship together, like how do you talk about money with your partner? And you're leading into my next question. Oh, Jessica. good. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> That's perfect, go for it. Question. Oh yeah, okay. Um, it's, you know, a lot of people wonder, well, what do we do? And those conversations evolve as your relationship evolves. If you're just dating, not living together, you don't have any kind of financial obligations, um, you know, really it's, I think the only conversations would be, are we going to buy something together or what can we, can afford or not afford. So those kind of conversations I think will happen naturally, especially if someone brings up, Hey, let's go on a trip together. You're like, I have student debt. Like I can't go on a trip. <laughs> but um, then you're, you're asking someone, you're assuming mm -hmm. someone's good enough with their money and honest enough, because what mm -hmm. happens if you end up in a relationship with someone uh, that they have a bad spending problem or a huge credit card bill and you just don't know? Well, that's, and that's the thing as your relationship evolves and you are more committed in the partnership, then it is important to be like, hey, we need to sit down and talk about like mm. where we're both at financially, kind of get financially mm. naked, so to speak. I yeah. think it fits at the beginning like of the relationship. Like you don't that. necessarily, yeah, you don't necessarily have to talk about it at the beginning, beginning, but as you're like, I think we're going to continue mm -hmm. to be committed, then you need to start talking about then that. Then it's but for business me, time. That is business right. time. I mean, <laughs> for me and my husband, we were together, I think, for like four years before we moved in together. And once we moved in, then we actually really, we really got financially naked. We created a mint account where we linked all of our accounts so we couldn't access the other person's account, but we could just see the numbers, oh. which was terrifying. And we talked about it. Like we, know, we both knew we didn't have debt, but I didn't know how much really he earned or how much he had. And, and same with me. And that was like the first real conversation and be like, Hey, and, and again, maybe it was easier for me because I was the driving force because I had a personal finance blog, but still mm -hmm. it took years for us to really have some deep conversations about it. And I think that's a common thing. Like I was, I was thinking about this when I was putting together some questions for you and I was just thinking, you know, there's a lot of people who are pregnant before they talk mm -hmm. about money. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they get, they get yeah. pregnant before even talking about finances. And mm -hmm. yes, there's like the position that you're in now, but then there's also different people's ideas of what comfort is. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, especially if you're meeting younger, you may both be in debt and that's okay. Yeah. That's not an mm -hmm. issue. Or someone may have to learn how to curb spending here and there. And that's okay. People can learn that. But if one person is comfortable at like, you know, uh, a combined income of a hundred thousand a year and mm -hmm. someone else is saying, no, I want like minimum half a million mm -hmm. a year, then those are very, very mm -hmm. different ideas. And mm -hmm. nowadays it's very difficult to make that kind of a money on one salary. So that's kind yeah. of expecting your significant other to pull their weight, so to speak. And, mm -hmm. and how do you even like, I don't know. I always find that just so interesting. Like, how do you have that that conversation, yeah. how do you start thinking about that? Because everyone talks about their dreams of, yeah, yeah, I'd love to have six homes in different continents, yeah. but, <laughs> but well, that's my dream. No, that's, yeah. Yeah. I'm the only Mind one you. that thinks that. I think like one way to kind of enter that conversation, and this could be like, again, 
even before you have it talk about money, it's really talking about what are your dreams? What are your goals? What are your personal values? And you can find out pretty quickly if someone's materialistic or not. And, you know, it's, it's easier to kind of have those conversations about what do we, what do we want in our lives? Do we have the same vision for our futures? Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll kind of give you a good sense of, oh, we're not on the same page. Now it's uh, whether, you know, up to you guys, if you want to become on the same page, but sometimes it will be, maybe this isn't the right partnership for me. Like for me and my husband, I know the reason we got along and still get along, but got along so well, like pretty easily, especially when talking about money was because we were always on the same page. We were always pretty much earning the same amount. We both had the same kind of upbringings, like pretty low to middle income. Um, never really had much money and, but are very ambitious and, and want to make something for ourselves, but also respect each other in that I have no expectations on how much he should make. He has no expectations on how much we should make. And we kind of come together to be like, okay, how are we doing? How can we work together and compromise? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's really the the nugget is having those shared goals. Mm-hmm. I think this is yeah. like a relationship. <laughs> yeah. It should be part of the relationship conversation, yeah. right? Like one of the pillars of the relationship that we, mm-hmm. it's not very sexy. Mm-hmm but it also is. It is. It's actually really exciting to know that you and your partner are on the same path and same, like you have the same dreams, you know, like how exciting is that you're working towards. And that's also a great thing as a couple. It's like, you're working towards this thing together. Like mm-hmm. that's kind of beautiful and exciting. I wanted to ask a little curveball before Raquel mm-hmm. gets into the, the next question. Um, I grew up in Hong Kong, so I come from a, uh, I guess I'd say a pretty traditional Asian family in some Mm -hmm. senses. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there's shared, like a lot of people from, I know from various Asian cultures and other cultures, Mm -hmm. they have shared uh, investments. Like for example, Mm -hmm. my parents helped me with the investment for my first uh, condo. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that investment is really theirs. And I'm, Mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm obligated and, honored to be able to support them into their retirement to be able Mm -hmm. to have these conversations at the same time I'm very much their daughter and I don't want to overstep how I mean have you had these conversations with people who have kind of intertwined family investments and how does how Mm -hmm. does that work you know Mm because it's uncomfortable for me but I also have to do it and I also like to do it but Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's tricky when family and money mix um, because everyone has, you know, different backgrounds, different expectations. So I think the the important thing is um, yeah. Having kind of those tough conversations that are awkward, but having those be like, so, you know, you, you were able to help me with this investment what are kind of the expectations? Like I'm happy, you know, and because I think that the problems arise when you don't know, when you make assumptions and they make mm-hmm. assumptions, you make assumptions, you don't have those conversations. So sometimes it's about having those kind of starting out awkward conversations about like, what does this mean? Do you want me to pay this money back? Or are you providing me this investment because you also hope to, to live in there when you're retired and for me to help you or what are we doing just so we're on the same page? And those, I've had all of those conversations, but I guess for me, the tough thing is, you know, as I was brought up feeling like my money is our money. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a whole big, it's a big family pot in my mind. Now Mm -hmm. my two sisters are not necessarily the same in their Mm -hmm. mindset, but I definitely subscribe to that. You know, if you're, Mm -hmm. if you're a part of a family and you know, if I ever, if someone was ever crazy enough to, to marry me, uh, (laughs) that would be the same thing. It would be like, well, are you adopting me and everything that I have and my family as Mm -hmm. part of your financial responsibility and vice versa? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess I don't even know how to, how to pose that question, but how do you, how do you keep that in check? Yeah. Well, I think especially when you're bringing a partner into the situation, especially if they have a different background, different outlook, Mm -hmm. that's again, a really important conversation, especially if you're like thinking about getting married or getting really serious, you need to know if they're, they're okay with that. Like, you know, having the conversation, uh, you know, that I think a lot of couples don't have and they just make assumptions as like, oh yeah, my parents are going to move in with us when um, they're of retirement age. Yeah. And you're like, oh, mm-hmm. do, do we have a conversation about that? Or you just made that assumption. Like me and my yeah. husband definitely had those conversations about all of our parents. And I think we've all made the assumption that they're, no, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> 
<laughs> love my parents, love his parents. Not going to happen. I think Buy the house would... next door. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's because we know it would be the detriment to our marriage. And you okay. also have to keep, you know, what are your priorities in, in whatever your relationships are like for me and my husband's like, number one, our, our relationship is number one. I mean, we don't have kids, so it would shift if we had kids, of course, but, mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, but again, it's like, we've had a ton of conversations so we can figure out what are those. Um, and so for, if you're bringing in a partner into the relationship and you're like, this is how I want to live my life. This is how I want to manage our money. Is this okay with you? They need to, they need to be on board. And if they're not on board, then it's probably not a, a, a good idea to pursue that relationship any longer because that mm -hmm. problem's not going to go away they're, if they're never going to shift that mindset. And it's also a mistake to think that you can change someone's mind. Yeah. And that's like a huge reason for divorce, isn't it? Just mm -hmm. financial. Just not being on the same page and, and, yeah. and not being like thinking of it together. And another thing too that I get asked a lot is, you know, when you get married or even just, you know, your common line, you're really, you're going to stick together forever what do you do with your money? Are you supposed to combine it? And I think it's a very traditional thing to think that you should combine your finances or you have to. It's the thing to do when you get married. Me and my husband don't. We have a couple mm -hmm. of joint things. We have a joint checking account, joint savings account for like travel and some of our joint um, savings goals and a joint uh, credit card. And that's it. Everything else is separate. And it doesn't make our marriage less valid or less together. We're less committed. That's just what works for us. And so when I talk to couples, it's like, there's actually no right or wrong way to do, but what do you want to do? What makes you comfortable? And also you can start doing it one way. And if you're like, I don't like doing this anymore, you can change it. You can, it doesn't have to stay the same the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, so I think what we're just going to go into that we've got kind of different scenarios based mm -hmm. on our different listeners. Um, and the people who came to the brunches and people who started listening since we started the podcast and, and they kind of range, uh, from maybe people who are newly out of school or newer mm -hmm. out of school and have maybe more still tr struggling to get out of debt. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I guess their middle realm would be people who are, uh, out of debt and now they're just, they're just gaining that momentum, that saving momentum. So they're trying to maybe save a nest egg or an emergency fund, mm -hmm. or just having a little bit more, uh, disposable income for their lattes and avocado mm -hmm. toast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and then we kind of have like a, the, the last stage, which is, um, people who are a lot more settled in their, in their financial realms and are maybe looking at investment now. So, mm -hmm. RSPs, stocks, well, presumably mm -hmm. maybe some people have already been uh, contributing to RSPs, uh, mm -hmm. real estate. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any kind of tips or pieces of advice for, for people in the various stages of that rules of thumb, how mm -hmm. much should you save, how much should you have as, as cash money that you can actually access mm -hmm. if there is an emergency and you don't have an emergency fund. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. Big questions there. <laughs> um, so let's start with, you know, someone just kind of starting out your kind of main things to really prioritize is saving up an emergency fund. So that could be your nest egg. And that was the first thing when I was in my twenties, I'm like, oh, I just want to save up $10,000. I'd feel so great if I had that money in the bank, cause I've never had so much money in my life. So it seemed like a crazy, crazy number. Um, and then also paying down debt, whether that's your student loans, your consumer debt, credit cards, whatever your debt is, becoming debt free as soon as possible and just saving up cash. Those should be your priorities. Now, I'm not saying that investing, sh you should wait until you have uh, all of your debt cleared before you start investing because different debts are different, treated differently. For instance, student loans, they can be relatively low interest. Um, so I kind of feel like if you're like, I'm going to take like 10 years to pay these student loans off. I don't want to wait 10 years to start investing. Then yeah. don't do that. Um, make some small contributions to your investments while making um, strides to pay off your student debts. But for things like credit cards and things that are really high interest, pay those off completely before you start investing because, you know, it's costing you 19% on your credit card. You're not going to make 19% on your investments. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> so those are kind of your key things. And then when you're kind of maybe a little bit more settled, 
then you're probably looking at other kind of priorities in your life, whether that is to buy a home or start a family, you're going to have some more obligations and hopefully you'll maybe be, you know, more settled in your career, making a little bit more money. You can upgrade, you know, increase the amounts that you're contributing to your investments. And then you have some, you know, make some more savings accounts to uh, start saving towards that home and, uh, um, you know, starting a family. Those are kind of the priorities. And then I guess after that what's kind of the next phase, maybe, well, I mean, everything kind of gets better when you're older, if I'm honest, like your hard years or when you're really young, I agree. like, right? I agree. like your twenties are rough. People always yeah. say this is the best time of my life. I'm like, what were you doing in your twenties? Mine were like, it was fun, but rough. Like I was yeah. broke and had no sense of direction and hated my job. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so my thirties are great. I love my thirties. Cause you have more sense of like who you are, what you want in life and that you hopefully you're earning a little bit more money and have more cash in the bank. So thirties yeah. and forties onward can be really great years. I agree. You care less. We just, ca- I just give less. Yeah. Fs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can't swear today. <laughs> But it's true. I mean, and really like you do get settled in yourself. You do. I think so. I I turned 30 this year, Mm -hmm. pandemic birthday. And (laughs) yeah, it was awesome. Um, (laughs) But I had a bit of a drive through. So I got to see some people from (laughs) from afar. It wasn't actually bad. It was pretty cute. Um, But but it was funny. Someone was asking me like how I feel old or I don't know something. And I was like, honestly, I feel like I'm in my 20s. I just have more money. Yeah. (laughs) I I also love that question. You feel old. You're 30. Like I'm 34 now. I'm like, you're 30 isn't old at all. You only think you're old when you're 30 when you're in your 20s. (laughs) But now, I mean, I look to people and they see someone who's 25. I'm like, I am almost 10 years older than that person. Oh my God. But honestly, yeah, I love being in my 30s. I have more money. I have more stability. I know who I am more. I know what I'm doing and what I want. So much better. Your 20s, you're just trying to figure out, figure it out, hopefully. Yeah. You're more on the, the right path in your 30s. Yeah. I love that. You know what I just adore about this whole conversation, Jessica, is that you've just made it so that it's so simple. There's not, oh, there's not <laughs> one point where I'm like, oh, oh, I'm intimidated by doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just want to say thank you for for making it so accessible because like you said there's a lack of representation uh in the finance world Uh, Mm -hmm. and you know when you're starting out you're starting your own business i know a lot of people who are in our community and the creative community our audience are all generally people who are hustling you know Mm -hmm. and that can be you know pretty terrifying when you're or not terrifying but pretty scary you know Mm -hmm. when you're starting out and you don't know what you don't know yeah and I think it's really nice that you've just made it so easy to say, well, you, you know, these are the simple steps. It's yeah. don't, don't overcomplicate it. Yeah. Don't over. I mean, it's natural to overthink. I mean, mm-hmm. again, when I think, so I've been working for myself for four years now. And also that similar to that year that I moved to Toronto, didn't know what the heck I was doing. The first year I was working for myself, it was terrifying. And there was mm-hmm. so much I didn't know. And I made so much, so many mistakes. But the one thing that now I can see in retrospect um, it's actually so great and so valuable to make those mistakes because you definitely learn your lesson after them. And guess what? You can fix mistakes. You can move forward. So what I always kind of tell everyone, because I mean, I, I still have bouts of like imposter syndrome and like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? That is natural. It's really about coming back to yourself and remembering why are we doing this? What is the kind of real purpose to this and not giving up and don't thinking not thinking that a failure is actually a failure a failure is just a lesson that you learned Mm -hmm. and you will think you'll be you know just think back to some of your failures in the past and you're like oh right i already forgot about that most of us forget about our failures quite honestly unless they were like really catastrophic but hopefully again you'll learn something from it I actually think money's a good teacher for that because Mm -hmm. you fall on your face a lot with money when you're in your 20s. I think most Mm -hmm. people do. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, rarely, I mean, I can't really think of too many situations, um, can you not pull yourself out? Like, Mm -hmm. you may need a little bit of help or you may need someone to kind of, you know, help lift you along or whatever, Mm -hmm. but... um, I think, I think it's kind of a somewhat safe thing to kind of fall on Mm -hmm. and then you can just go back to that savings, go back to that. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a different situation if you're 
if you're unable to get work or something yeah. like that. But, um, but even then think... that's not permanent. Like yeah. we all fall down sometimes. I've been unemployed several times. I've been underemployed yeah. a lot of times for most of my career. I've had two jobs. And so I think getting rid of this idea that, you know, if you're having a hard time right now, remember it's not permanent. It is temporary. Things will improve as long as you keep on trying basically. And one last question, because you just touched mm -hmm. on something. How do you, do you have any recommendations for negotiating as a woman? Because I think mm -hmm. there's, I mean, well, I don't think, I mean, there's obviously <laughs> a difference between negotiating as a, as a female and as a male. Yeah. And, um, I think males are a lot more, uh, it's a lot more common for them to mm -hmm. negotiate salaries, mm -hmm. uh, for women, what tends to happen studies show is that they don't um negotiate unless they're kind of given space to mm -hmm. so how do you show up as a woman and negotiate mm -hmm. right out the gate oh there's it's funny i used to be part of this um group of women this was a few years ago that we all kind of found each other through each other and met up at each other's kind of you know living rooms so this happened for like the course of a year and then it kind of disbanded but it was really to support people we all either worked for a startup or worked uh for ourselves and a lot of the conversations we had were about negotiations and i remember so vividly this one person is like we all need to start asking for money like a white bro would yeah <laughs> it's like they have you know that kind of person and we all know that person we've all worked with that person who has less experience less skills less credentials than us and then you find out they're making twice your salary yeah. and it's not because well yeah part of it is because there's a lot of injustice in this world and so many other things in the society but also maybe they asked for it and you didn't yeah. and so although there's a lot of things beyond our control the one thing we can is to always negotiate never be afraid I used to have this fear. What if I ask for more and then they rescind their offer for the job? They're never going to rescind the offer. They'll just come back with a counter offer. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to do your research when you're negotiating, you know, say it's a new job um, for, you know, what is an acceptable salary range? Talk to other people in that field. And now it's easier than ever, even though we're all at home, you can go online, you can go on LinkedIn, you can um, reach out to friends who may know people to find out what are some numbers. I mean, I do that all the time in my space. I work for myself, but I have a lot of friends who do lots of similar things. We ask about rates. So we aren't undercutting each other and then we're asking for more. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, just really confidence is very, key and uh i think just ne always remembering to negotiate is is so important and also if you need help there's so many negotiation coaches out there too that i'm like if i, I really wish i can go back in time and work with somebody who could <laughs> put me in the right direction because it's not a natural thing for it we don't know how to do it i never learned how to do that so sometimes it feels like really really intimidating but i will say though with all that said I made so many mistakes in my career when I was an employee. I never successfully negotiated. Um, and it's not because I, I, I failed. I did actually, that's not true. I did successfully negotiate one job where I was offered the job and initially they said, okay, it's going to be $40,000. My like, great. Got the paperwork. It was 35. I'm like, you said 40. It's like, well, we were going to start you here and then we'll work your way up. I'm like, I will not start because this is i think was it was like halfway through that first year of living in toronto and i i was working in a job that i hated but i didn't want to again jump to another job that you know i knew wasn't going to be a permanent job for not the amount of money i was promised and so i demanded like no i'm, I'm not going to start here unless because i was supposed to start in like two weeks like i'm not going to start unless you give me 40k and they gave me 40k but for every other job there i was way too scared to actually ask for money and the last job that i had that i ended up quitting I did actually ask for a promotion. I got, I, I, I was promised a promotion. Didn't actually happen. There was a lot of corporate uh, situations going on, a lot of mm. stuff in the workplace that was beyond my control that I didn't know about. And uh, unfortunately, I did not get a get, did not get a raise or a promotion, but worked out in the end because I think my path was meant for me to actually leave and start my own business. So silver lining. <laughs> the world was just trying to show you. <laughs> I think yeah. so. I think like that yeah, the, the universe was like, this isn't the job for you. Why are you trying to stay here? <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I'm just going to do a very quick, like 20 second recap, uh, just mm -hmm. so that we've got some of these key terms. So you went from film, uh, into, into finance, you want people to know that they're not bad at money. We just don't have the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, personal finance, you've said it, 
so well. It doesn't have to be complicated, so don't make it complicated. Uh, women have not really felt like part of the conversation traditionally a lot of the time, so it's great that there's more resources out there. Let's change it to a spending plan. Let some people the FIRE movement works for, others not so much, but let's keep money mindfulness at the mm -hmm. forefront of our brains and enjoy our money. Uh, we can track our net worth as mm -hmm. something easy to do quarterly or monthly, however we prefer. Uh, in, in there, you spoke about asking for money like a bro, which I love. <laughs> Just keep that in, the, in your mind. Um, you can look at uh, having conversations naturally with people around money, the people that you love and care about, and talk honestly about what you can't afford because nobody do does necessarily want you to go into debt. I love the time getting financially naked. I love <laughs> that you uh, assess your relationships in part on the dreams, goals, and values that are shared. And problems will arise when you make assumptions, which I think is just a thing for life. Mm -hmm. uh, sort out your priorities in the relationships. When you're starting out, have an emergency fund, pay down your debt as reasonably and quickly as you can. And then as you get on in your career, you can open more savings accounts, start your investments, make those mistakes, and remember the why, because everything you do is not permanent. Mm -hmm. oh, See, that was a slammed. That was <laughs> so good. I'm like, did I say all that? <laughs> wow. I sit there scribbling in my little notebook. Oh, yeah. yeah that's amazing. amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, Jessica, I just want to say thank you. Um, Raquel, I want to say thank you for bringing uh, Jessica onto this podcast. I know that you had been silently creeping on I was, on I was the cyber stalking Jessica <laughs> for so long. And Raquel said to me, she was like, you'll never believe who we've got. We will never <laughs> believe this. And so oh my gosh. we're really, really grateful because financial literacy is, is so important. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we both love how, how accessible you make that. So where can we find you? Where can people come and learn more from you and learn more about your amazing guests that you bring onto the podcast with you? Yes. And work with her because they can work yes. with Jessica and work well. with you, of course. Well, I'm, I'll I'll be honest. I'm not taking new clients, but I am going to be <laughs> launching a few programs in the new year. So you can, yeah. So there's some exciting things in the works for sure. So you can find me first and foremost at jessicamorehouse.com and get on my email list, jessicamorehousecom slash subscribe to, you know, find out what's going on. Uh, my podcast is uh, on all podcast platforms called the Mo Money Podcast, and follow me on Instagram. I'm trying to be hip. Like I'm not that old, but I feel <laughs> certain platforms like Instagram, I still feel like an old lady. So when you say I'm trying to be hip, you sound exactly <laughs> like me. Yeah, like I'm like, trying to be hip, but just wait, I'm, I'm being Instagram hip. is just like so hard. How do people know how to pose? I don't know. I don't know. But anyways, please follow me because I do have some good content about personal finance. <laughs> I won't give you beauty tips, but I will tell you what to do with your money. So yeah. I'm at Jessica I. Morehouse. We have a podcast episode for you. We'll send it over to you. Okay. Oh, yeah, please do. I'll oh, share. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thanks again. And we will see you soon, Jessica. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, Bombshells. In order to continue to elevate, subscribe and don't forget to click that little bell so you can get notified every time we have a new badass brunch. Until next time, stay focused, fierce and fabulous.